Christmas season and there were some very important people related to it and we are going to discuss one of them today, uh, the Virgin Mary. We read in the book of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Mary, the mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, has always held a high place of prominence in the Christian church. She is worthy of such honor. To look into her life in a very intensive manner, we will begin by saying that Mary was a pure woman. Uh, there are those that don't know God that would like to say that it's all a lie, that she was not a pure woman. Even in Christian pulpits a number of years ago, uh, what we term modernist preachers or liberal preachers would say that the word virgin in the New Testament really was not virgin in the book of Isaiah, that we'd had so many translations uh, that uh, it was changed. And then a number of years ago, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and they found the book of Isaiah intact, not in small pieces, but in one piece. And this scripture, a virgin, said an unmarried girl, which is a virgin, uh, shall conceive and bring forth a son. And all the liberals shut up from that point forward. You know, God has a way of closing people's mouths. And I am, I am sure that there's another time or two coming for mouth shutting. <laughs> I believe that Noah's Ark will be not only observed and, uh, from airplanes and helicopters, but I believe it will be found and that tourists will go there and they will go inside that door and they will see where the animals were stored and kept during that time and they will smell the stink of 3,000 years ago, uh, 4,000 years ago. And then they will know for sure that when God says a thing, that it is true. Uh, we'd all be better off just to believe it like it is, wouldn't we? Uh, Jesus said to Thomas, says, you only believe because you see. More blessed are they that don't see it, but yet they believe. God give us a believing heart. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 27, it says to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And so very precisely, the word of God says that this was a holy person, a pure person. Mary responded to the angel that conveyed this message from God to her uh, spiritually. There are many ways to respond. If somebody asks you to do something, you can respond in anger. Still do it in anger. You can respond in unbelief and say, well, it won't work. I'll do it, but it won't work. Well, it, you're going to keep it from working, sounds like. Mary responded beautifully. She responded spiritually. In Luke 1 and 28, which is the next verse, if you had your Bibles open, the angel said unto her, came unto her and said, Hail, you are highly favored. Now, brother, when heaven says that, you better believe it. Highly favored. Jehovah is with you. Blessed art you among women. Uh, that is a tremendous uh, salutation from an angel from the throne of God to speak to a human person. This means that she had already had very close re relationships with God in prayer, 
in reading the word and in being close to God or this could not have happened. She was already highly favored. Jehovah was already with her. She was already blessed among women. And, and so now she was moving into a higher and a greater dimension in God. That same chapter, chapter 1 and verse 31, it says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, our Savior. The next verse is verse 35. It says, And the angel said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. And therefore also that holy thing which should be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And then you see a, 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 a spirit of willingness come into this woman, unique and unusual and remarkable. And that's in verse 38. Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your will or to your word. And the angel departed from her. Whatever business and whatever work she had planned, here was a divine interruption. The Bible says she was espoused to Joseph, which means she was engaged. And whatever engagement activities they were going to perform, they got abbreviated. You know, sometimes when you're going to work for God, uh, your plans come to naught. And the things that you plan to do, you don't do. And so here we find that Mary was willing you know, to lay aside all the preconceived plans and, and all the things that she wanted to do for herself. And she said, the will of heaven be done. The will of God be done. You know, if we had a few million people like that on the face of the earth today, we could turn this world around. We could completely turn this world around. If we were to have people that would say, yes, Lord, whatever you say is what we're going to do. And whatever plans I had made, I lay them aside. Uh, God could do some things on the face of this earth. Mary immediately felt that she should uh, go and, and visit her cousin, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, Mary was living uh, way up in the north country in Nazareth. And uh, Elizabeth lived right close to Jerusalem in Ein Karen. Uh, just just below Jerusalem there, right down the hill, uh, going toward the west from Jerusalem. And she went and saw her. And when she arrived there, Elizabeth spoke with a loud voice. It's the same chapter, verse 40, 42. She spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And this was an operation of the Holy Spirit because uh, she wouldn't have known uh, otherwise uh, that uh, Mary was married. She didn't know anything about it. But when revelation comes and, and God begins to speak to, through various ones, no doubt this was a, a strong confirmation that she had left her home up there to come and visit her, her cousin Elizabeth, uh, who was of the priestly order in that family. And, and so uh, when she got down there spontaneously before they had any conversation, Already, the Holy Ghost spoke out and said, You're the blessed of the Lord, and that which is within you to be born. It's a, it's a blessed thing. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. You, you need uh, other people to lay a little hand of blessing and encouragement upon you as long as you're a human. It don't matter how great you get uh, in, in, in ministry. You need, you need encouragement. I, I've often reflected back that uh, Howard Carter was a very unusual man. Uh, he, he came from a very wealthy family. His father was an inventor. And, and when his father died and they divided up the, the wealth, he took all of his and started a Bible school and he let students come free until the money gave out. And I, I wouldn't have been that foolish and you know it. You know? <clears throat> because when the money got out, they had to start trusting God. 
uh, well, why didn't they go ahead and trust God before the money gave out, you see? And, and uh, why didn't they let everybody share before the money ran out? But anyway, he, he, he was a very unusual person. By the time he was 12 years old, he was exhibiting in the National Gallery of Art in London and brought home a, a prize for his, uh, for his painting. And so he, he was a, a gifted artist. He, even from a child, he was a gifted artist. And, uh, and uh, he had a lot of qualifications. They were so quiet that the average person couldn't pick them up. Uh, but very often when he'd get through preaching, he would come to me and say, did I do all right? And it would just embarrass me. No, no, like he knew he had done all right. He knew he was one of the best. He had to know it. He, he knew that he had spoken in the largest churches in the world. He knew that he was the general superintendent of his denomination. He knew he was the president, the founder and the president of that Bible college. And he'd ask a young man, did I do all right? And, and, and then I would, Oh, I'd say, you know, you've done the best. You, you, you're the greatest. And, and, and my, you, you saw how they loved it. You, you saw that they just, just want you to talk longer and, and to give them more. And you could see immediately he felt better. It is remarkable to me that it don't matter who you are. Now, now you wives can be the best cooks in the world. And that, that husband's got to keep on saying you're good. You see, the ladies enjoyed that. And you men just sat there as if you'd had cucumbers for breakfast. It doesn't matter how good they are, they still want you to say it's good. They know it's good, but they want you to say it's good. It doesn't matter who we are, we need, as long as we're a human, we need encouragement. And Mary went to get encouragement. And she went to her cousin Elizabeth's. And Elizabeth gave it to her, gave it to her supernaturally. She was going to whisper in her ear and tell her what had happened. And she got there and Elizabeth knew all about it. And begin to say, it's, it's wonderful what God has done on the inside of you. And the fruit of your womb is going to be, is, is going to be a glorious thing here. <laughs> she didn't have to, just, to tell her about it. Uh, she had it. And so she returned home. And, uh, and then the government got into the act. It's amazing how the government can get into the act. All the way from Rome, they said you had to pay taxes. And that you had to go to your hometown to pay them. Wouldn't it be bad to have to go to your hometown to pay taxes? How many were born a thousand miles from where we are right now? Wouldn't you hate to go home to pay taxes? Have to go to South America to pay taxes. Isn't that, isn't that something? Isn't that something? I'd have to go all the way to New Orleans. I'd just soon to pay them South Bend, I guess, you know. They, they, had to, they had to go to the place where they were born to pay taxes. Did you know the government had to do this for one reason? To fulfill prophecy. <laughs> Did you know governments have to fulfill prophecy? Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem. There was no chance of him ever being born there if old Caesar hadn't have passed a tax over there. Joseph would have never left off his work in his carpenter shop. If he hadn't had to. He would have never gone to Bethlehem again if he hadn't had to. But brother, when Uncle Sam says go, you go. Or you have a problem staying if you don't. And so Joseph got up and he went. Isn't that amazing? He might not have been conscious at that time that this babe had to be born because it had already been prophesied in Bethlehem, he had to get up and to go. God can move some mighty big machinery to get around and help you if you'll let him. Yeah. God could pass laws to help you. And the lawgivers wouldn't know what they were doing at all. And God was doing it just to help you and to bless you. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? God is so, so good. And so, here they journeyed and went to Bethlehem. In Luke 2 and 5, it says that he went to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now, now they, they knew she was great with child, 
but it was so imperative to pay those taxes, they had to take a chance. And, and so they, 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 they had to go. And when they got there, in that same chapter, chapter 2 and verse 7, when they got there, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And so when they got there, uh, in, in those days, there'd be very few places where visitors could stay. When we were far, far inland, uh, uh, China, uh, and it's a cultured nation, you see. You go back into the jungles of South America, they make no provisions for visitors at all. You sleep under the trees or in your hammock tied to a tree, and there's no provision. But way up near in, in the Tibetan world, in every town, there was what we call a horse inn. It's very closely related to your motels where you keep your iron horses and sleep upstairs over your horse. Well, that's exactly what they had over there, just a wee bit more primitive. And, and so they had this place, and all downstairs is where the animals stayed. Then you climbed up a ladder. I didn't say staircase. You, you climbed up a ladder, and that's where you slept. Uh, you, you slept up there with the hay. And they would come and get some all night long to feed the animals, and, and making noise and stumbling and growling as they came and went. But anyway, you soon learned to sleep. And you didn't sleep in the hay. You brought your own folding cot with you. And you put your own bed down. And you didn't eat their food. You had your own cook with you. It was uh, not quite as night, nice as the Hyatt houses today, but uh, <laughs> they were working on it. Uh, but they, in Bethlehem, maybe had one of these kind of places. And, and it was full. Everybody had to pay taxes, and so it was full, and there was no place for them. And the Lord of heaven, the Lord of heaven found that there was no room for him on this earth. And you want to know, you ought to put a little line under that, no room for him. There isn't any room today. The devil would rather you would talk about Santa Claus. He'd rather you would talk about chickens. He'd rather you talk about ETs. Just anything to keep your mind off of Jesus. Because you talk about Jesus, you get saved. And, and the devil sure don't want that to happen. And so while she was, uh, had had this child in this, in this uh, place, God said, I'll give you some more comfort. You know, God is a God of comfort. And Luke 2 and 16, it says, And it came to pass, as the angels were going away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And so, some more comfort. Here was the child, here was Joseph, and the child looked like other children. And then these shepherds came in and said, Say, we've seen angels. And the angels told us that the Son of God was born. The angels told us, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. It says the angels told us this. What a comfort to Joseph and again to Mary. You know, if God wants you to do something for him, do you know he's going to comfort you all the way? You didn't get much of out of that, did you? Do you know the Lord is going to comfort you all the way to heaven? He'll bring comfort into your lives. If you'll just walk with God and obey God, He will bring comfort into your life. He's a comforting God. These simple shepherds there came and said, Hey, we know what you got. You don't have to tell us. Uh, we've been talking with angels. Well, Joseph had talked to an angel and Mary had talked to an angel. This was quite, you know, quite common now. They were talking with angels, but here were shepherds that had been talking to angels. And we know what you have here. This is not just a regular child. This is the son of the Most High, and he's going to save the world. And then a wee bit later, in Matthew 2 and 1, it says, When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, there came wise men from the Orient to Jerusalem. And then in verse 11 it says, that When they were coming to the house at Bethlehem, did you hear that? They got moved out of a stable. Isn't that nice? Came into the house where they were in Bethlehem. They saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts. These came just in time. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now you say, why those commodities? Those were the commodities that would sell in the open market in any town in that world of that day. 
In the world of that day, gold was a medium of exchange. You could get anything you wanted with gold. Frankincense was very precious to be used in worship, to be used in a fragrance in the house. Myrrh was very important to their lives. And so here they had the three things that any market would buy, that they could take it with them, and that was their bank. It was a bank. And uh, I believe it helped them all the way to Egypt and all the way back to Nazareth, all the way through. They had plenty of whatever they needed. This was a further comfort because as soon as Herod found out these three wise men didn't come back and tell him about it, all the boy children and all of the area of Bethlehem were destroyed. And so uh, this was a sad thing. No doubt it touched her heart very deeply too. In Luke 2 and 22, it says that when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, that they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Mary fulfilled all the law concerning her son. She fulfilled, just because she had talked to an angel and just because that, uh, uh, she had a phenomenon on her hands, she did not become rebellious. She fulfilled the total law for him to be circumcised. And so she brought him under the house of God and brought him to the right place. Now, the, possibly it could have been done in Bethlehem, you know. They had some kind of a place of worship there, but she wouldn't do that. She tread all the way over to Jerusalem to the, to the, to the high temple, and she had this, had this done in the temple of God. She took him there and had, him, had it all taken care of, brought him to Jerusalem, the Word of God says. She didn't, she, didn't, she didn't say, I'll just take a smaller town or I'll do it a little less. She went all the way with it. In that same chapter, verse 34 to verse 36, when she got into the temple, God gave her another encouragement. Now, now, I just want you to know that whoever you are, you need encouragement. And that's one reason you should come to the house of the Lord, to get encouragement. You know, you know, when you get discouraged, the devil says, stay home, stay home, stay. Well, that's where you got the stuff at. Don't stay where you got it. Come to where there isn't any. We don't have any. We are all encouraged. We give out, hand out encouragement in the house of the Lord. In Luke 2, 34, it says, Simeon came and blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel for a sign which shall be spoken against. He was getting her ready. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, and she was of a great age and had lived with her with husband uh, seven years from her virginity. And she came rushing in at that moment, at that moment, and began to praise God and said, I was told that I would see this mighty one before I, before I died. And God has kept me alive to see him. My, what comfort to her. Assurance upon assurance and assurance upon assurance they had to believe. And I just want you to know that we all need those kinds of assurances. Just because I am a pastor is no sign I don't need your comfort, you see. I might even need you to say, that was a good sermon, you know, Brother Sumrall. The, the, the devil might tell me it's a poor one, you know. And I might believe him, you see. Everyone, if she needed these kind of assurances, just blessing upon blessing, encouragement upon encouragement, we all need it in God. She taught this new one that God had given her. In Luke 2, 51, it says, And Jesus went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he was subject unto them. He was subject unto them. She found a lot of time teaching him and blessing him. And just before that, in verse 48, it says, When they found Jesus, they were amazed. And his mother said, Son, why have you brought this, dealt with us so? Your father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he was in the temple answering questions, asking questions to the highest dignitaries, of the land, and he was only 12 years old. But he went back, the Bible says, and became completely subject unto his parents. And, and uh, 
it shows you that she did a lot of teaching that God wanted her to do. Not only did she do that, but she, uh, well, I ought to tell you she had a lot of other children. In Matthew 13, 55, is not this the carpenter's son and is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And in verse 56, it says, and his sisters, are they not all with us? So he had all of these brothers, one, two, three, four, and sisters, plural, have to be two. And, and so there were six other children that Mary had uh, besides, besides the Lord Jesus. So she lived a very normal life after that. Did you know when God uses you and blesses you, you can live a very normal, healthy life on the face of this earth? Uh, when, when, you, when you get a blessing from God, you start acting like an angel. It's a fallen angel. Yeah. Uh, and and we, we have people like that. We have some women that get so spiritual they can't even be a wife to a man. You just need a spanking is all you need. It was Mary that coaxed Jesus into his first miracle. He said, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. She came to him and said, listen, there's no wine here. Do something. And she coaxed him into his first miracle. She followed him wherever he went. You, you find in Matthew 12 and 46. She followed him to the cross, John 19 and, and 25. And in John 19 and 26, she was a, a, the object of concern even in the dying moment. She was standing right up underneath his cross. And you'll be delighted to know that in Acts 1 and 14, she was one of those waiting in the upper room to receive the power of the Holy Ghost. What a wonderful person. What a wonderful person. She was a person as much as you are a person. But she was a person yielded to the power of God and of the Holy Ghost. What a beautiful life. We should always say thank God for such a wonderful life. She was not, she, she was not unhuman in any way in the world. She's just like you. But she was yielded unto the Savior. 